antenna rotators. That's uh, an interesting subject. From time to time I get asked about rotators. What's the best rotator to use? Will it work with this aerial or that aerial? And I've used rotators all my ham radio life, which means to say I've been using rotators for ham radio over 60 years. Well, what I'm gonna do is just to tell you my own experience of using rotators, which may well help you to make the choice yourself and decide which rotator is best for you. So, the subject of this video is rotators for ham radio. Now we need to use a ham radio rotator in order to point our antenna in different directions. Many antennas have got directivity and therefore we can take advantage of that by pointing the antenna in the direction in which we want to make contact with distant stations. You can actually have uh, rotators that also rotate in the vertical um, and that's used for satellite work but I'm going to concentrate on rotators that rotate in the horizontal plane, north, south, east, west, and so forth. And the easiest way to do that is to use a rotator. I do recall, of course, as a, as a youngster, not having a rotator. Um, I had a mast with a, I think a TA-33 on top of it, and I had to rotate it by hand. And I, this is absolutely true. Um, I had my, sta I was still living at home, I had my station in the bedroom, and fortunately, we, had, we were in a bungalow, we had fairly large windows. And uh, I used to open my bedroom window, um, turn the loudspeaker up high, jump out the window, <coughs> and go down the garden and rotate the antenna in the best direction that gave me the maximum signal. Now, in those days, uh, using very basic receivers, I'm not even sure we had AGC then, so it, was, it wasn't too difficult to hear a difference in the volume level as I rotated the, rotated the antenna. But I do remember a number of times I jumped out of the, the, the window. I mean, it was, it was a bungalow, so it wasn't a problem. I, I went out the window, through the window, down the garden, rotated the antenna, back through the window again, and uh, onto the... Uh, onto the transceiver or transmitter, because we had separate receivers and transmitters then. And I think I must have done that sometimes in my pyjamas. I'm sure I did it at night, but there we are. I couldn't afford an antenna rotator then, but uh, things have changed. So we need a rotator to rotate our antenna in a particular direction. One of the things that uh, somebody asked me recently, actually, is how do you avoid getting the cable your antenna cable tangled up with the rotator because it's going to rotate and eventually it's going to coil around the rotator or the mast. Well, the answer to that is all rotators have a stop on them. They, they don't travel much more than 360 degrees. Usually they go a bit beyond that, but once they've gone through a rotation of 360 degrees or a bit more, they stop and then you have to go back. It does mean to say that sometimes if you want to go a bit further around in a particular direction, um, you may have to go anti-clockwise, in other words, go all the way back in order to get to the new direction. Let's say, for example, that the um, rotator stops at north and your antenna is pointing northwest, which is what, around about 10 o'clock, isn't it? And you want to point it to the east. Well, likely is that the only way to get to east is to go in an anti-clockwise direction because probably the um, rotator will stop just beyond north. Therefore, to go to east, you've got to go all the way around the other way. Um, but it does mean to say that with that arrangement, you don't have to worry about getting the cables uh, tangled up. They won't go on and on, wind and wind and forever and then break. So rotators only are able to rotate through 360 degrees or a little bit more than that. So how does a rotator operate? Well, the rotator has actually got a motor inside it. And uh, all rotators, almost all that I've come across, will run off of AC mains, but you're not sending AC mains up the cable. Basically, the control box uh, has a power supply inside, and that power supply steps down to a much lower voltage 
and it's that low voltage which goes up to the rotator. Now the simplest of rotators will operate on three core cable and that means to say that you can use cheap three core cable to take your DC voltage up to the motor at the top of the antenna where the rotator is. The reason you need three cores is because you need to drive the motor and also the motor needs to be able to be reversed and also it needs to know where it's pointing because all rotators have a control box which actually mimics the position of the rotator at the top of the antenna. In other words, if you want to turn the antenna north, you rotate the dial to north or you press a button to, to get the indicator on the control box to point to north and you rotate north. So in other words, you can always see which direction your antenna is pointing by looking at the control box. Some of the larger rotators, and in fact a good many of the larger rotators, use more than three cores. Uh, five core and six core is quite common and some of the really big rotators may use more than that. So you do have to budget for multi core cable. You can of course double the, the, the cables up. You could use two pieces of for three core cable to get six uh, control lines to the rotator. And the reason for that is some of these rotators have quite elaborate um, systems for not only rotating but for having presets and also braking systems which is something else we will talk about a bit later. So you do need to budget for multi-core cable of some sort but don't worry it's not AC mains that goes up the uh, to the rotator at the top of the mast, it's a much lower DC voltage. So what's the best size of rotator for what you want to um, use it for? Well, generally speaking, there's, there's what we call lightweight rotators. MFJ made one, I think it's still around now, may have a different label on it now. MFJ do a lightweight rotator and it's, I think it's really designed originally for TV antennas. And that will quite happily uh, carry um, a smallish VHF array. You could have a, a six or seven element Yagi on there and uh, perhaps just above it um, um, an 18 element 70 sems antenna um, and those two antennas would be quite happy on a rotation of that size. As soon as you go to bigger VHF arrays you've then really got to step up a bit to something a bit more hunky. Uh, there are two ranges of rotators. Um, Yesu make a good range of rotators and a firm called Create in Japan also makes some excellent rotators. And there's enough in their range to cater for even, I say even the biggest, almost the biggest antennas you're likely to come across. When you're buying a rotator, it's probably best to err on the side of safety. In other words, get one that you think is a bit over-engineered for what you want, because that gives you a bit of leeway. The last thing you want is to find that your rotator fails. If your rotator fails, it's guaranteed it will happen in the winter when it's really cold or it's at a, on top of a mast which is not that easy to get at and which you've got to get ladders or get somebody in to help you. So it's always better to go for an over-engineered rotator, in other words a rotator that is a little bit above what you really need but it gives you that margin of safety so that you don't have to wander out to, um, in the dead of winter and try and fix it. There's nothing worse than that and it's uh, it can be quite expensive and quite time consuming if you've got a, an antenna that is difficult to reach. There are two ways of mounting a rotator. The most obvious way is to mount it on the top of the mast and the cheaper rotators um, come ready to mount on the top of the mast. The more expensive rotators very often have a flat plate um, option. In other words, you can mount the rotator on a flat plate, and I'll come to that in a second. Alternatively, if you want to mount it on a mast, then you very often have to buy the optional adapter kit so you can mount it on top of the mast. So let's talk about why you would want to mount it on a flat plate. So in the case of a tower with the rotator sitting on a flat plate, the stub mast carries on up through an aperture at the top of the tower and on top of that, um, mark, that stub mast you place the antenna. It's normal to actually install what is known as a thrust bearing. The thrust bearing sits right at the top of the tower so the, the mast sits on the rotator, goes through the thrust bearing and then 
uh, on up to the antenna. Basically a thrust bearing actually has two purposes. First of all it will help take the weight of the antenna off the rotator but secondly it will also help or stop any lateral strain on the rotator because one of the big problems with rotators is the movements of if the move, if there's movement of the antenna and movement on that um, stub mast it causes quite a force on the rotator and the longer the stub mast the more force there is on that rotator so the thrust bearing actually takes all the strain and it doesn't have to worry about any lateral movement of the stub mast because the stub mast is held in, pla held in place with that thrust bearing. So you've got the rotator at the bottom and further up before, as, the, as the stub mast goes through the top of the tower you've got the thrust bearing. This is a uh, Yesu rotator. This one, believe it or not, is uh, nine years old and it still works. I took it down recently because I wanted to do some uh, work. This one, by the way, has got the lower, whoops, the lower mast brackets there. I think you can see those there. And um, the stub mast goes into the top of the rotator there. And this is a standard uh, connect, um, cable connection that Yesu uh, produce. You can buy this cable ready terminated. It's probably the easiest way to do it, actually. But yeah, this uh, rotator has been in use for about nine years and it still works well so they are totally totally weatherproof so provided you don't do anything silly you don't overstrain them uh, they'll last for ages and this here is the uh, standard Yosu control uh, unit you've got the, the um, up down buttons there and uh, on off button there and most importantly you've got uh, the indicator there which tells you which direction the uh, antenna is pointed. Built in mains power supply there, and as I said earlier, it's low voltage that goes up to the uh, rotator. And I just turned it round, and you can see there that's the uh, cable that goes to the motor outside, and then you've got your mains cable uh, just down there. Right, let's talk about oh, talk. What is talk? Well, I'm not a expert on mechanics by any manner of means but torque basically is the rotational strain that's put on the rotator when you turn an antenna and when it comes to halt it sort of wobbles about a bit and puts a bit of torque on the rotator that's not too much of a problem but if you are in an exposed location or it's windy then the rotator or the antenna will tend to want to rotate it's rather like a sort of weather vane and that puts torque onto the rotator now somebody did say to me um, why do we put the rotator at the top of the mast why don't we put it at the bottom of the mast well there's a very good reason for that first of all of course if you put it at the bottom of the mast there's a lot more weight because the rotator's got to and handle the weight of the mast as well as the antenna but there's something much more important than that and that is torque imagine that you're trying to undo a screw and you've got a short screwdriver and you can't quite do it if you use a much longer screwdriver then you can do it much easier it's all to do with torque and the transmission of, of, of energy down a longer um, screwdriver now, as I say, I'm not an expert in mechanics, but fundamentally, if you put the rotator at the bottom of the mast, there's a tremendous amount of strain that can be put on that by rotational torque that starts at the top and effectively is magnified at the bottom. So that's really a no-no. You're going to strip that rotator. So it really comes back to really using something which has got a margin of sort of safety. Now the uh, standard um, uh, Yesu rotator, the G450, is really the workhorse for a lot of stations. It'll handle quite a large VHF array, provided there's not too much stuff mast above. And it will handle a fairly lightweight HF antenna quite happily. It certainly will handle something like the hex beam. That would, that would, that would be no problem for the G450. 
if you're going to put something like a, a mono band 20 meter yagi three element 20 meter yagi mm, i think it might be pushing it a bit you might have to go up to something a bit more rugged than the g450 again safety comes into it safety margin comes into it as i said earlier in this video you don't want to have to sort of bring the whole lot down in the in the winter to try and sort out a problem with the rotator and really and truly if there's a problem with that rotator in as much as there's it's not man enough for the job then really you've got to write that rotator off because if the gears inside become damaged it's really it's really not possible to economically repair it so i would say that the g450 the asu g450 is probably good for a lot of stations but if you've got the larger array such as say a 20 meter three element yagi full size yagi um, or four or five element yagi certainly you need something heftier than that and even a quad a quad can be quite a strain on a, uh, a rotator I, I, i'd hesitate to use a g450 on a uh, full size quad so um you know think about it now, i know but if you go up to a heavier rotator, you're talking about a significant amount of money. But I think that's something you just have to accept that if you want to sleep happily at night in your bed when the wind's blowing, then think about whether or not you're buying the right rotator for the job. It's not possible really to sort of say to every, every scenario, um, this is what you need, because it depends how high is the tower, what is the wind likely to be? What is the weight of the antenna? What is the rotational force of the antenna, etc., etc., etc.? I'm sure some of you that are involved in engineering can compute that, but many of us are not. And I would tend to say think about it seriously before you invest in a rotator, particularly if it's something of some size that could cause this sort of rotational torque on the uh, antenna the thrust bearing certainly takes a lot of the strain away from a rotator but it doesn't really remove the torque now some rotators particularly the heavy duty ones will have brakes on so they are pretty well protected and that's why you pay the extra money so i hope i've covered it in some detail i'm sure that some of you think well, at the end of this video well wait a minute peter i still don't know which one to buy <laughs> and um this is sometimes a sort of the subject of a telephone conversation and you can't really put your hand on the heart and say this is this is going to be totally safe i think what you need to do is think about it and just think that if you're going to have a pretty large antenna up there it might just be worth investing a bit more money and sleeping safe at night. There we are. Thanks for your support on this channel. It's much appreciated. The figures are still going up. I do appreciate it. And I do appreciate all the comments you make. Um, don't forget that if you make comments below the video, they are read. And some of the comments do contain some useful information. So do read the comments. Some of them can be a little bit rude and a bit abrupt. Well, you know, unless it's obscene or something like that, I'll leave them in. You can judge for yourself. Uh, it's, it's, up, it's, up to, it's up to you. In the meantime, enjoy your home radio. You take care. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.